Let us pray. Good and gracious God, insofar as these words represent your word, may they be blessed. Bless also the meditations of our hearts, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Seasons Fusion Online, which is a worship resource, for this Sunday reads, This week, the disciples get their chance to see Jesus and to see for themselves that he's alive. The passage that Carla just read. They too are then given a command to go out to serve. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. So, like Mary, they are sent forth. And one way to live out their calling is apparently to live with forgiveness. And Jesus says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now in the Psalm and the Acts readings that of the lessons, we get a glimpse, a glimpse of what living in community provided for the early Christians. It allowed them strength, support, and perhaps even survival in those early days after the resurrection. The grace we find in the forgiveness of sins that we are called to extend to the community around us is in forgiveness and in love. I should read that again because I didn't do too well on that. The grace we find in the forgiveness of sins we are called to extend to the community around us in forgiveness and love. So we have the picture here of Jesus' disciples and the followers uh, are in Jerusalem after the cross, after the resurrection, and they're trying to collect themselves, basically. You know, what now? Uh, how are we going to do this? And so they come together in or near the temple in Jerusalem to pray, to worship, to break bread, and to make sure that they share with needy widows, orphans, and others their possessions. Now, you may think this sounds awfully cooperative, collaborative, or even socialist. Uh, that's the scripture passage. Uh, John didn't create that one. It's there. And when they sold their land or houses, they laid the prophets at the feet of the apostles who were the leaders, the authority, and they would then make sure that there was enough for all, so that no one went, uh, no one was need uh, or had enough. In Acts 2 and Acts 4, we have two summaries of the early Christian community or the Easter people in Jerusalem, as if Luke is trying to say to us, this was important. Here is the first community of Christians post-cross, post-tomb. And so Luke paints in an ideal way of being with and for one another in community. Here is not the, in our society at times, the individual, uh, individualistic dog-eat-dog. -dog. You know, if I do it, I can do it, I don't need my neighbors. I'm self-reliant and all the rest of it. No, here's one of mutual sharing, of caring, of collaborating. They really cared for one another, for each other. Now, of course, they were a little or a lot scared of the Jewish leaders and the Roman soldiers now that Jesus, their leader or Messiah, had died and risen. And if we would lose our leader, our Messiah, we would be a little scared too. And we had some fairly strong forces around us uh, as they had when the Roman army had taken over the country and the Jewish leaders were fairly strong and they just had crucified our leaders, so to speak. So Christ's followers were trying hard to find their way while living in difficult religious and political settings. Gradually, they were viewed as a Jewish sect 
much like we sometimes view others as a sect, and or a strange group eventually breaking away from the Jewish family and the Jewish faith and trying to establish a small Christian community or church. Now, I dwell on this first scripture passage because isn't that what it's all about in Christianity? It's not only our faith and belief, but it's also how we live it in relationship to one another. How we draw on the community, whether it be the church service or the church activities or what have you. I want to go to two examples, uh, Mennonites and Hutterites. They're also known as Anabaptists, which means adult baptism. Uh, in the Protestant Reformation, the Mennonites and the Hutterites froze, froze like a freezer, that early New Testament Christian community that I just described from Acts. They froze it and say that's the community model of living and sharing together. And so the Mennonites and Hutterites broke away from the Lutheran, Calvinistic, and Swinglian way of being church and creating Christian community. Like in the 1500s, when Luther was doing his thing, Swingley was doing his thing, John Calvin was doing his thing, they broke away from that because they believed in natal baptism and living more like the Acts community. So Jacob Hutter, their leader, it was the fog of Island Day during the Protestant Reformation. He was burned at the stake. The other reformers didn't like what he was coming up with. And so in February, on February the 24th, in 1536, in Innsbruck, Germany, he was burned at the stake. Pretty rough stuff. Awful stuff. And the Protestants should not be proud of that, at least in, 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 in any way. He founded the Hutterian, Hutterian Brethren and the Hutterite Colonies, which in North America now have grown since 1965, when the principal of Emmanuel College in Toronto handed me a book on the All Things in Common, the Hutterian way of life, or the Hutterite way of life. They had then in 65, 1900, in, in 1965, 144 colonies. 144 churches, homes, uh, communes. And in 2018 in North America, there are 439 colonies, a tripling of the Vitarian way of life. And the colonies are located mainly on the prairies in Canada and the US. In Canada, in this year, there are 335 colonies with 168 in Alberta, 60 in Saskatchewan, 107 in Manitoba. In the U.S. in this year, 104 colonies with most of them in Montana and South Dakota. So they created on the basis of the Acts of the Apostles, those two summaries, their church or community or colony. Now, other Christian church communities were created, like the Old Order Mennonites, or the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, with its own calendar, liturgy, culture, language, and the like, and probably would say we're one of the oldest churches, Christian churches around. The Ukrainian Catholic, the Roman Catholic, and last but not least, the Protestant churches in 1500 on, or denominations with congregations aplenty. Among the Protestants, Whenever someone sneezed or had a mat on, we created another denomination. And, you know, thank goodness for 1920 and 1925 when the people on the prairie, the prairie churches, saw the light and said, this is crazy having four mainline denominations using four buildings. Let's pick one building uh, and start sharing and do some good stewardship around that. So it led to unification, started by many a prairie church, uh, with the creation of the United Church, with the Methodists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and on it goes. And now at this time we see uh, talks between the Anglicans and the Lutherans, and I think gradually 
were becoming in North America somewhat like the churches in Western Europe, Holland, case in point, where they're forming now the Protestant Church of the Netherlands, including it has several other branches. And I think we need to go there eventually. Um, I would say, uh, about, well, seeing that I'm on camera here, I may not want to say that. <laughs> but let me try it anyway. Uh, I would say eventually, we as Protestant Christians need to uh, start talking and saying, how can we too perhaps become part of the Catholic Church, Catholic means universal, uh, of Christ? And maybe we need to start gradually moving in direction. And some of you think, well, uh, hopefully the Pope will approve a bit on a few areas, but, uh, you know, and the like. But uh, that's, I think, down the line. Followers of the risen Christ, they vary. We vary in the way we create a sense of community. And we can create a sense of community for the believers. Now, many will meet once a week, like we tend to do. We get this uh, 9.30 or uh, 11 o'clock hour, and we try and meet them for worship. Others, on a daily basis, go to Mass. Too much for me. Uh, still others uh, gathered in their church community or church buildings three or four times a week for Bible study, the sacred story, prayers, community service, outreach, social justice projects, uh, meetings, and the like. Uh, this pastoral charge, I'm impressed with the way you folks uh, frequently are involved in the life and work of the congregations, as led by your capable minister, and I'm glad he's there, and because I can just watch, uh, and, uh, uh, and a teacher, and many committed lay people. Uh, so, one way of theologically interpreting these various denominations is to see how each one of us tends to view Christ and culture, or Christ and community, with a large, a large a capital C in, uh, in terms of culture and community. Some Christian believers and churches view Christ and, capital A and D, and culture, or Christ for uh, the community as a close relationship where the church and community work very closely together to strengthen the congregation and the larger community at schools, hospitals, volunteer uh, support organizations, businesses, and the like. To illustrate, our former friend, who's uh, John Cotton, who's deceased now, unfortunately, uh, he was pretty well the saint in the Swan Valley. Uh, and he used to say, the United Church people tend to serve in many aspects, or all aspects, of Swan Valley community, and clearly are for and with their neighbors in numerous ways. Now that sounds like it's a little bragging, uh, but it, I think it's a description. Uh, and uh, because we have a theology that reflects our actions, uh, or vice versa. Now, the weakness with that viewpoint, Christ and culture, or Christ and community, is of course that there is no difference whatsoever between what the church does and the community or the culture does. And if that's the case, we're in trouble. Uh, yes, mainline Christian churches care deeply about and be, are for and with the community. But at times the word taught or spoken or preached has to be not only a priestly or comforting and pastoral sustaining emphasis. You know, we care for one another, we are concerned about the humbles, we are concerned about one another's needs and so on. But also periodically, it has to be a bit of a cutting message, disturbing message, <laughs> a message that pushes us out of our comfort zones into a, new, a different way of looking at things. And so we need both the pastoral sustainer caring for us deeply and also the prophetic disturber to push the edges a bit and to see growth. 
The high rate and old order Mennonite Christian church communities tend to see Christ apart from or against the larger community or culture. So you have the Christian community here and we worship together and so on. The Hutterites live in a church commune or colony in which they live and work together like the early New Testament church in Acts, very clearly. They have frozen that model as followers of Christ and hold generally literalist beliefs and will also fence off where their church begins and ends. Like if, if you, you have to be an adult believer and you can also be excommunicated. Now, the last time I heard that expression in the United Church was probably a hundred years ago. Uh, and so I'm glad we don't use that expression. Um, these Hutterite Christians are hardworking, peaceful pacifists, do not vote or run for public office. But like the old order Mennonites, serve the community when there is an emergency and they respond and help and so on. So a, question, a key question for all of us is, are we inclusive Christians or exclusive ones? Inclusive that includes all of us. Do we see our neighbors as folks who think like us, look like us, or do like us, or just certain folks? How tolerant and caring are we? And when do we draw the ethical lines around our values, beliefs, or actions? Now, the United Church has a good, not perfect, track record in trying to care for all, in drawing the circle wide, in coloring in all the colors of the rainbow, or welcoming all. Your own pastoral church's mission statement is clear in its intention. We are a loving, welcoming, and evolving community of Christian faith, committed to nurturing spirituality, offering care, and building respect for all. God is the heavenly parent of all. Christ's life and love and work is for all God's children on this globe. We believe in the risen Christ who represents the heart of the sacred story for all God's children. We are open to all seekers and searchers. We do not excommunicate. We look for Christian community of the risen one who holds our back, who supports us in the chaos and the vicissitudes of life. I like that word, vicissitudes. Uh, it goes with propitious. Uh, if you don't know what it is, look it up. <laughs> Christian disciples and followers, empowered by the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Christ, speak with boldness and are encouraged to speak with boldness in our culture. I don't know if some of you watched the students and the rallies from, uh, what's the name of the school, Parkland uh, Stoneman Douglas High School. Did some of you watch it on TV? Um, okay, some of you did. And what I admired was their gutsiness, their boldness, saving our lives, and their boldness in including all the rainbow color of people uh, in their communities. Hispanic, white, black, Asian, and so on. Uh, children, youth, and parents, and teachers for the well-being of all. And how strong they spoke the truth to power, like the NRA, the White House, Congress, Senate, and so on. You really have to admire their, their, their gutsiness to do so. And also, and in some ways, we as Christian believers need to risk for one another for our culture, for our communities, and our lives. Let's close this sermon on Christian believers and their faith communities by asking you to read with me the United Church's new or contemporary creed, 918, in your written hymn books, 918. It's the theme of We Are Not Alone. Pretty tough one. The preacher can't find it. <laughs> okay.
okay? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God.